Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I want to acknowledge two people, three people who know Normandy. They were participating in the first pilgrimage of the Status and Views, and we uh, suffered together with our stuff. You know, bus driver who didn't know how to deal with our so narrow, remember, roads in Normandy. But we got to get a glimpse of what would be. Uh, the life of Central News, even, the, even though the landscape has been in a constant changing mood. The title of, uh, of this talk, you know, 40 minutes more or less, uh, is written page uh, 13, but uh, and, uh, I will use the appendix page, find it for myself. Page, not page zero, uh, page 42. The title is John Hughes, A Man with a Burning Heart. There are so many ways to, uh, to know St. Hughes, so many ways of knowing a person. St. Hughes, I was thinking of what comparison I could, uh, I could use this, this afternoon. You know, when we, uh, when I was still, a young man, long ago in France, you know, before 69, you know, uh, we, uh, we used to see uh, North Americans, both Americans and Canadians, coming home, you know, in Paris, but we are visiting Europe. <laughs> My goodness, for, for a Frenchman, Europe, how can you do that in 10 days? It's impossible. But there is, is a way to do that, is to have a, a large glimpse of the various possibilities, having an old book and say, oh, this this place I want to come back. It deserves to go and be seen in details. It deserves to be approached from uh, a very day-to-day -day and deep uh, approach and closer to this, uh, to this, to this Europe, paper you know, landscape. An example, for instance, in Mount Saint-Michel, you can, you can see Mont Saint Michel in Normandy, so now it's Normandy, it used to be in Brittany. It's Normandy, and we just have some kind of overview with a plane. You can do that in five minutes and get very emotional and trying to use your imagination. But if you go to Mont Saint Michel, you need at least, we do it in an afternoon, uh, but we need at least two days. If you want to discover and to feel the 1000 years of history, of this monastery uh, 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 up the, the hill, the little mountain that's in the sea. So today, this afternoon, I agree, and this session is more or the same thing, uh, an overview of what we can learn from, from, not only from a historical point of view, but a spiritual point of view, uh, how to become really missionaries of mercy. Father Elan uh, gave me uh, a little job to do uh, at, during his, uh, his talk, talking about the difficulties of central news. Um, I will finish by that. I think it's, uh, I would like to, to begin by uh, seeing the very moment when John Hughes really, and Father Elan talked, gave the quotation, from the John Hughes uh, memorial, not memorials, another way of English, you know, the journal, you know, it's in that. John Hughes began to have a burning heart at the age of 12. And he wrote, he wrote, you know, I began to know God at the age of 12. And this is so serious because, as, as uh, Father Ellen told us, you know, it's not knowledge, cat catechism. I went through so many years of catechism in France, five years of catechism to make our first communion. And I was not a believer. It gave me a culture, and I'm very thankful for this culture, but not faith at all. Oh, sorry. I have to be obedient to this machine. So, uh, uh, but for John Hughes, the way it was done, close to uh, his teacher, a and priest, 
he began to know Jesus, preparing himself for his first communion, encountering Jesus in the Eucharist. And this followed him all his life. So and at that time, he began to have a real burning heart, a desire to be just like Jesus Christ, to be Jesus Christ, Christ with two legs, two arms, and a big heart. And, and also, not to bear the mind. And this is very the first step I would, I, I would like to mention. And then he developed, I'm not going to, to, to talk again, I'm going to share them, but it was those moments when he entered the College of the Jesuits. He was not that bright. He became bright through work. And this is why I like this guy, because this guy, you know, never had, at least never wrote, huge revelation. You know, the, I know the archangels never, never appeared to him, at least if it happened, it, it, it never wrote about that. He was so ordinary, and I need, as an example, someone who is very ordinary, because, you know, God never took the, the, phone, you know, the phone to call me, Hi Jerry, how are you? <laughs> I had to discover the faith of Jesus Christ slowly away, but you know the way from St. Louis, St. Louis, Entering the Jesuit had to to work and to study a lot to become one of the first and one of the of the of the uh, I would say the most respected student because he became a member of the sodality of the Virgin Mary, which was the cream, you know, uh, 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 we say in French, uh, of the students to be accepted in this group of high school students, you know, to be members of the sodality of the Virgin Mary. And then, when again, once again, he, just, he really developed this strong love through Jesus Christ. So strong that he wanted to, uh, to become a priest in the end. Not in the end, but at the end of his, of his uh, teenage. And then he decided to go to, to Paris. Normandy, Paris. For us, you know, we are accustomed to uh, to go to the moon, so it's not a problem. Uh, yeah. we, we take a taxi and look, right to you in the, in, in the moon. And at, at that time, to go to Paris, you have to have a, a horse. And I'm not going to, uh, uh, I talk too much, I have to talk about the, the history of the, of, of the horse. He wanted to leave because of his parents and didn't want to lose him. He was probably a very good guy. And you know, mother, mom, it's very hard to let your, you know, more or less point one, you know, go as a mom. So he wanted to want to have to say goodbye. And finally the the, the, the horse which which behaved that day like a donkey, you know, <laughs> refused to go. So he had John Hughes, you know, like you know, you know, imagine a guy who is 18, 20, 20, you know, 22 going back to, to home and said, Dad, I want to go to Paris. <laughs> so, <laughs> after discovering, I'm not in my church, I'm in front of her, you know, of the very learned people here. So, I don't have to move. So, and came back, and finally, his dad gave him his, his blessing to go to Paris. Then, let me jump. After his ordination, uh, he was 25, and we had something very, very important at that time called. Plays. Play. And you're all American, so you know also in your program the British history by heart. If I say 1665, what are you going to answer me? The Great Play of London, yes! London! And then what happened just to, to get rid of the plague in London in 66? Fire. The fire! They say the right, the, the right way to get rid of bacteria. But don't do that to me when I have cold. <laughs> so, and the plague, and John Lewis is in Paris. He has to be obedient to, to the formator. And then he knows that in his own village, in his own um, neighborhood, people are dying out of plague. And you, you, I invite you to ask Mr. Google to, uh, to 
to go and play it, or even to uh, to go and learn about uh, there is a movie about the Seven Sandal Park, and we will know what plagues were, were about. Everything became a desert. Corpses dying in, in the fields. It was a very, very high, a dangerous uh, sickness. And of course, priests at that time, even though they were good, didn't want to uh, to to be contaminated. So no one to give the sacraments. No one to take care. Of these dying people in the streets, in the fields, in in, uh, in the farms. So he asked twice to go to help these people. And this is what I'm looking for for when I, as a formator uh, uh, of seminarians. I want people asking me to go and help the poor, like Saint John Hughes, because he developed this sense of being present to give both, you know, the sacraments and to help people and families to bury their dead. So burial, the superior, after two, two uh, requests said, well, it's not in our rules, you shouldn't do that. But compassion, rules. So finally he said yes. And he went to uh, his own uh, village and in the area with another priest and both together went with a little box of uh, Metal, white metal, and went to give the blessed sacrament and uh, the last rites, as we used to say at that time, to the dying. Then he came back to Paris. Of course, he went back you know, to be a good young priest. And uh, after being sent to um, to come the Normandy, once again the plague, once again problems, once again people, once again the desert, human desert and activities. And he decided to go, and then at that time he was uh, the, he was not the superior. He was with a member of his community, the Oratory in Khan. And once again he went, and we have, if you go uh, on Google, you will see this image of Saint John Hughes in a, in a barrel. He lived in a barrel for, uh, for during all the period where people were dying. Of, uh, of, I would say of AIDS. But at that time, it was more terrible than AIDS. And he would go and go with people, have them in the same way with a few friends. And at that time, he, some of, the, of his confrères also helped him. And at that time, the history says that he helped two of his brothers to die in his arms. Because when you had, when you had this uh, sickness, you couldn't stay in the community, you had to go out. So, and he was, you know, it's some kind of a miracle. He was able to, uh, to survive, and then he was um, appointed superior of uh, his brother's house in Khan. So, this one, one moment when I say, John Hughes, a uh, burning heart. And, we, and because you are all Buddhist now, so you have to help me to choose young men and young women who have a burning heart. Young men that we choose cannot stay, you know, sleeping and having three hours na naps in the, in the evening. They have to go and deal with people and be sensitive to the misery of the people. So you say, what is the heart of mercy? The heart of mercy is the one who is able to carry his own heart the misery of the miserable. Porter dans son cœur les misères des misères. And this is what drives us. And this is a special vocation to the church. You know, some of young people have a vocation to be good administrators. Some have a vocation to be completely adorers of the Father. They are able to spend eight hours of prayer, eight hours of sleep, and then a few hours to, to play on. But you know, it's important to, to discover and to help us here at St. John Hughes. When we read the motto that's written here on, on, the, on our you know, booklet, go proclaim the good news with a burning heart. Go proclaim the good news 
with a burning heart. But I'm you know, expressing in a very soft and more spiritual way. But the same thing is that, you know, you have discovered, you have discovered Jesus, and you want people to know it. And you talked about the restaurant. I didn't know you had a special taste for good food. But yeah, so we have to go and proclaim the good news of the day. This heart has to be burning in you, and we discover, and the Good Shepherd Sisters here, yes, has heresies of St. Louis and St. Euphrasia of Pelletier. And Euphrasia have the same heart. They have to go. And we don't mind to, if you live, if we live in very uh, poor houses, we go. So first thing, John Lewis taking care of, of, um, of these people. John Lewis also uh, taking care about women. Taking care of women. I have no time to describe the situation of women in the 17th century in France. Just read the news. Just read uh, women in slavery, children in many countries. Just read how we still uh, there is a systematic human trafficking. This would give me some kind of idea of what the, the women were um, had to live, go through in the 17th century. Coming from their poor villages, those who had to, to find work and have, their, and have their families had to go to big cities. In Paris, at the same of the same of Central News, with we the numbers of prostitutes were between twenty thousand and twenty-seven thousand prostitutes. In Caen, what was what Central News, you know, found in the congregation, he was not that happy because you know they had to work sometimes just below the, the, the bedroom of his bedroom in Caen. We still have the house where the congregation was founded in Caen. I will invite you to go and see that one day. So he, he's, he had to do something. He had to do something. And he listened really with his heart to what people would tell him. We have to do something. He found it with all sorts of, of oppositions, all sorts of difficulties, because he had a burning heart. He founded the Sisters of Holy of Charity. It was very, very difficult. The first one couldn't do it. The second was a lady, a lady woman. The second lady left the house, you remember. She left the house and all the furniture and left, you know, as, as the director, a young lady, 22 years old, and he, he married. What he did, because he had a burning heart, because he was following the gospel of Jesus, he put together. It was unbelievable. High class sister, you know, well educated, uh, with money, and these girls are under the same roof. And look, look, I don't have any time enough to uh, to talk uh, about uh, about the conditions of our women and the, the foundation of the order of the, the order of the charity. <coughs> you know, as I said, we are going to have to uh, have another meeting. I'm thinking of a we Congress about uh, to, to reduce my my. Uh, Dreams, the, the week congress, you know, and I was dreaming at the table this morning. You know, Central News will be will celebrate 100 years of uh, canonization within 10, 10 years. I'm not going to, to, to wait for 10 years, but I would like to have, you know, our sisters of the Radio of Charity of the Good Shepherd from all over the world come and tell us what they do out of compassion, out of mercy, because they have from the origin. The, the heart, the burning heart of Sandra Lewis, and transferred to them through the burning heart uh, and the wisdom and the wonderful day, you know, wisdom of um, Mary of Asia Beltier, you know, the founders of the Good Shepherd Sisters. And also listen to, uh, to Mother Antonia, uh, who you know, discovered with a big heart that prisoners, policemen, criminals are all children of God, and she gave the, the, the 30 years of her life you know, working in the in jail in Tijuana. So this, what's burning on us. Now, as a priest, you, we, we can be just a good Christian and does, and do what the Jews did. You just have to be 
worldwide have to be free uh, interiorly and go. Now as a priest, John Hughes was so sensitive of the realities of his people. He was a pastor in a way, because he spent you know 50 years missioning. First thing he said, let's go. Oh, by the way, he he wrote a lot. And unfortunately, unfortunately for us, you know, we couldn't find all the books he wrote because of the French Revolution. But we gathered at, at the moment we have 12 volumes plus one that has been published, 13 volumes about the writing of Saint Denis. So those and then unfortunately they are not all translated into English. But also those French or Spanish you can go there. Let's see what for instance at the beginning of his little book uh, about baptism. And the I retranslate it because you know when we translate it to other languages, when we don't know how to translate an expression, we just jump over it, mm -hmm. skip it. He said, it is most deplorable, as page 42, it is most deplorable as to weeping tears of blood to see that of the countless numbers of persons who have been baptized and consequently admitted to the rank of children of God, members of Jesus Christ, and living temples of the Holy Ghost, with obligation to lead lives in conformity with these divine qualities. There are nevertheless so many more who live like pagans and even like demons than those who, be, who behave like true Christians. This is what, what he meant when he was asked to go and serve with his team uh, of missionaries in, 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 uh, in the French villages. From five missionaries to thirty sometimes. From five weeks to five months staying. Just imagine here having thirty priests in this area, living, some living at, with, with us at the community. It's a burden. But it's also, it could be also a grace. What, what, what did he discover? They have no idea of how it is to have been baptized. They do not know what it is to be Christian. They scarcely ever consider the wonderful graces and incomprehensible favors that God conferred on them through holy baptism. And they spend their whole lives without ever thinking even once properly about the solemn promises to his divine majesty and the obligation and so on. So the reaction of a priest now who sees the ignorance and, and in an ignorance translated into behaviors. And remember the conditions he had under uh, under his eyes. Not only plagues, but also wars, corruption. You know, revolts. You know, our congregation was born a few years after that the, the, the role that the king's armies just cut into pieces. The poor peasants who tried to manifest and find a way to survive in France. And so he had all these people in front of him. And he had to talk and to realize that one of the reasons, the key reasons why things happen that way, is because your people, uh, in both parts, didn't know Jesus. And no clue about baptisms. Being at page 42, uh, as why uh, did I choose, did we choose the expression with burning cross? Because it's, a, it's one of our motives in, in, among the years. St. Julius says in Latin, sorry for the Latin, Servire Christo, Christo e et Eius Ecclesi. Serve Christ and his church, Cordelago et Animo Voletti, with a very close model, with a burning light, with a wonderful heart and with an animal in Spanish, with will. Uh, I asked, or just for an anecdote, I asked one of my confrères I was in the novitiate with, or the Dorian France, he sent me. 
20 French, different French translations of this expression taken out of the books of the Wikipedia. Uh, because it's not easy, but it's, it means burning hot. And also, uh, I gave you here, you know, the expression, our heart was burning. You know, this disciple of Emmaus coming back, was not I, our heart burning while he opened to us the scriptures? And this is what we would like to, uh, to develop here as, as a focus, as a perspective for the years to come here at, at Ascender News. Then, when he uh, is talking about um, the holy heart of Jesus, we say sacred heart because, you know, after centuries, but, you know, the sacred heart of Jesus. And he looks at the, at the heart of Jesus as a furnace of love. You know, furnace, uh, people here don't know that even in California we need a furnace, <laughs> you know, to have, uh, you know, hot water. But let's see, let, let's see what he's done. Uh, uh, say about uh, the, the sacred heart. It is certainly true that this adorable heart is a burning furnace of divine love, radiating its fire and flame in all directions, in heaven and earth and even in hell. Did you ever imagine that uh, the sacred heart, the holy heart and God is trying to love people that are in hell? You don't think of that. I remember one of the deacons uh, asking the question to parishioners, but you know, in a homily, parishioners don't have the possibility of answering. So the, the preacher answers for them in case they don't give the right, so the right answer. Because they said, what about the sinners? What do they go? And thinking that all oh, the people would, would think, well, they are in hell. And the deacon said, no, they are here. <laughs> Sinners and people are here in the church listening to the word of God. If we lift our eyes and hearts to heaven, hearts to heaven, what shall we see? And the list of what we see. And we, you know, in our culture, we have difficulties of uh, entering in this mood, this perspective of thinking, even our faith. We shall behold an innumerable army of saints, patriots, prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, and virgins. What are all these saints? They are so many flames from the immense, immense furnace of the divine heart of Jesus. Flames of the immense furnace of the divine heart of Jesus. Is it not the love of that kind heart which brought them into the world, and lightened them with the light of faith, and gave them strength to conquer the devil, the world, and the flesh? And page 43. Is it not the goodness of that amiable heart which adorned them with all virtues, sanctified them in this world, and glorified them in the other, which kindled in their hearts? The love they bear to God inspired their lips with divine praises, which is the source of all that is great and holy and a miracle in them. Uh, the timekeeper left, so I don't know how many minutes. Two hours? <laughs> <laughs> so here's the list. He's giving the lists, you know, of what, and I invite you. Uh, and it's better than it's to be well, you know, to, to reread the, the text, you use a high, you know, highlighter, whatever. Uh, this is a draft, by the way, don't, don't publish it, because uh, it, uh, this book uh, hasn't been yet audited, so I do want to, for, for future, for future publication, to, to read it again. So, John Lewis, Johnny Hart, and he discovered that through so his whole personal experience, of love, uh, of the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ, through Mary, and this is very emphasis on that. And we are, we have, we have here a special, a special saint, 
I want to quote uh, Father Carlos. Sometimes he says uh, profound things and uh, we don't mention. He said that in Spanish, but I'm going to translate it in English. First in Spanish, you give me two minutes in Spanish. Un día el Padre Carlos estaba hablando con su, con su grupo. Y un día el Padre Carlos San Juan, o se inflama el Padre Carlos, no dice, San Juan, ah, creo de esto. Un día dice, digo eso. Y sabes ustedes que Juan Llores es un saint, pero no cualquier santo. Es, es un santo, pero no cualquier santo. Y dice, you know, this is what's said by St. Janus. And remember, St. Janus is a saint, and not whatever saint. <laughs> This is when you listen to Father Carlos in his language, they will also be inflamed. <laughs> so, it's very, uh, oh yeah, 10 minutes. So, <laughs> the writings, and now his sermons. You know, with Vatican II Council, we had an expression how to read the science of the times. That means to try to discern the presence of the Holy Spirit, to see the exact reality as it is and not as we think it is. And it means to, we, to do that, to recognize Christ or to, to find out the, the, the reason of, 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 a, of an event, we have to be together. So let's see page 40. This is a letter, and it was, a, I suppose, he was a bit proud of himself. You know, it was in 69, so he was 60 at that time, so he wasn't completely transformed by the Holy Spirit. I am 68, and yet I am not. So, if we, in this letter, you think that John Hughes is a bit proud of himself, please forgive him. February 8th, 16. 61, the day on which they were celebrating the Feast of the Holy Heart of Mary. The, each, uh, John Lewis was preaching in Paris at the convent, because you know we have high class convent and we have low class convent. We have, we have you know, you, I don't have to, sorry, I don't want to play, but, uh, because I just get into trouble. But uh, the, the, the queen was at this convent where he was preaching. And let's, let's see what he said. Uh, what he says to his priests uh, as a letter. No email at that time, so he had to, to write, and he had also a secretary and a brother. The queen arrived toward the end of my sermon. I told her many things with respect to the fire, which burnt a section of the loaf, and I began addressing her this man. You know, the, the loaf was, a, at that time, it was not a museum, it was the place where the king and his court was living. And they make a great deal because they had to make a fire with the candles because of some curtains and some images had been burnt. It was a trial, you know, an earthquake for the people in the, in the, in the court. So John, John Hughes, being with people, said this to me. Madam, I have nothing to say to your majesty except to implore you most humbly since his divine majesty has brought you here, never to forget the powerful sermon that God has preached to you and the king through the fire which destroyed part of the roof. You are well aware that for Christians nothing happens by chance, but that everything takes place through the providence and the will of God. This fire, therefore, was the result of his mandate for you to understand, and it meant several things. First, it was you know, that it was strictly forbidden to work on Sundays and feast days. At that time, the kings were the Catholic king, and he would govern the church as well as the bishops and the courts. Remember what Father Father John told us. Kings uh, were allowed to build loaves, but that God was ordering them to lighten the burden of their subjects, to take pity on so many widows, orphans, and people overwhelmed by poverty. Stop looking at your belly. 
that kings and princes were permitted to indulge in decent amusements, but to spend all their days, weeks, half years, and even a whole lifetime in doing so, was not the road to paradise. That Paris was full of our faces, would trample gods underfoot and do things to shock even the demons. So that, if their majesties were aware of all this and refrained from using the royal authority to punish such horrible crimes, they would be held responsible for them before God and bring down his vengeance, have a different blood, but his vengeance and curse upon their heads. That, if temporal fire had not spared the royal house, the eternal fires would spare neither princes, nor princesses, kings, nor queens, unless they lived like Christians and took pity upon their subjects. And that, if this material fire had shown no respect for the portraits and likenesses of the kings which were in the palace of that bird, neither would the fire of God's wrath spare their originals unless they use their authority to destroy the tyranny of the devil and sin and establish and to establish the kingdom of God in the soul of the subjects. That was my sole interest in saying these things. That's the interest of my master and my God, as well as that of the salvation of my king and queen, from whom I would lay down a thousand lives. That it, it was indeed a pity that the great personages of this world were besieged by a horde of flatterers. I had to go to the, to the dictionary to see the meaning of psychophants, the translator put. So, besieged by a horde of flatterers who were so poisoning and destroying them by the flatterers that they almost never heard the truth. That preachers were very culpable in the sight of God to suppress the truth and trusting, so that I should consider myself most guilty, guilty yeah, if I did not say all these things to Her Majesty. Finally, I entreated her to accept them as coming not from a man, but from God, that I was only a worthless creature, a miserable sinner, but that in the place where I was standing, and as a representative of God, I could say, like St. Paul, that all who have the honor to preach the Holy Word of God, for Christ, therefore, we are ambassadors. I was fulfilling my, fulfilling my duty as ambassador of Jesus Christ in order to bring the words of the King of Kings to great Queen, to the great Queen, and that I am not going to accept them as such. I'm, I'm going to let you finish the, 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 the letter to, to these missionaries. The Queen was not offended. Because at that time, you know, kings and queens had to be reminded that they were Catholics and they had to go by the Gospel. And this man has no fear. We know today someone, the Bishop of Rome, Pope Francis, who has no fear. We fear for one day for the nature when he talks directly to the corrupts, when he talks directly to the mafia. And he does it. Julius did it. He brought, he brought him a series of enemies, of course, and particularly when he um, founded his community, uh, when um, you know, he had to make a stand between the heresy of Jansenism and being faithful to, uh, to the Catholic Church. When he left uh, the oratory to found the congregation, he didn't left, he didn't leave the, the oratory because uh, he, was, he was mad at his, at his brothers. It made, the main reason we find out, we found is because, and Father Edan uh, talked about that, because he discovered, because of his burning heart once again, that after all these days and months in mission, missioning in the countries, in the, in the, in the villages, if priests were not converted to Jesus Christ, if priests couldn't do the right thing, if priests couldn't be involved and preach the gospel and be trained, nothing would be uh, stable. 
nothing would be transformed. So, and then also, so he got here, uh, he decided to found a seminary because John Lutz was a famous preacher. You know, Billy Graham, you know him? This is the type of guy John Lutz was. You know, a huge reputation with, uh, uh, you know, bishops would try to have him preach in, in, uh, in their cathedrals, in their villages. And he decided that preaching was good, but the, the, the words are the words, what to found a seminary. And this is, um, this is one of the reasons why he left the oratory. But this caused him a lot of difficulty. Because among the oratorians, we had people who were on the side of the Nazists. And John Lutz was, uh, I don't remember the expression he had, uh, but he was not very, very tender about this heresy of limiting salvation, limiting salvation to a certain, a certain number of elected. And so all of all, and he and all his enemies for all his years, these years, and particularly in the 60s, when he was in 1665, he, he, he got to in real trouble. But as I said to, as we say here between ourselves, John Hughes would never complain. Let us pray for our benefactors. When I pray for the benefactors, and when we pray, and we tell you now, you know, for the, the Jewish benefactors who help us with the seminaries, we pray for you guys, because you give us, you know, you help us. But when John Hughes prayed for his benefactors, those who helped him to be closer to Christ, he prayed for his enemies. Those who were who, who sent calumnies against him. Those who were denouncing falsely to the, to, to the king. Those who made him, you know, being chased, excluded from Paris or, or from any missioning in the court because of lies. So I have to stop. And I hope that all the, those old members of the Judas family. He also has a burning heart, passionate, because he is a passionate of Jesus and living Mary. Amen. 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 Amen.